this fabulous century, how Australia's first kidnapper was caught out by his own dog. And how did the dingo do it? The dingo's got my baby. From the pyjama girl in the formalin bath to the sex drug deaths of a famous scientist and his lover, these are Australia's greatest murder mysteries. It's still the same old story A fight for love and glory A case of do or die The world will always welcome lovers As time goes by Bobby Checker was teaching us how to twist but the hip generation were experimenting with free love and drugs and acid was about to leave the laboratory. And it was the era of nuclear testing when the Cuban crisis took the world the closest it's ever come to being blown sky high. It all seemed a million miles away from these sleepy, leafy northern suburbs of Sydney. But on December 31st, 1962, the spectres of sex, psychedelia and espionage were unwelcome guests at a party at a respectable Chatswood address. Amongst the guests were Dr. Gilbert Bogle and Mrs. Margaret Chandler. What happened to them remains one of the most baffling mysteries in the history of Australian crime. Dr. Bogle was a brilliant radio physicist who was about to take leave from the CSIRO to work on a secret laser project in the US. He also had an appetite for sex with other men's wives. Margaret Chandler and her husband Geoffrey were guests at the same party where an artistic contribution was required for entry. Dr Bogle arrived at the Chatswood party with this rather bizarre drawing which has been retained by the state coroner. He'd drawn a beautiful woman with blue eyes but with two mouths and a severed hand and a foot and a rainbow, all rather unusual. Gib Bogle arrived on his own, but left the party an hour before dawn with Mrs Chandler. With romance in mind, they drove in Bogle's Ford Prefect to the banks of the Lane Cove River. A few hours later, they would be dead. Their bodies found by two boys looking for golf balls. His clothes weren't actually on him, they were draped over him. Pulled apart by the seams. Yeah, she was in... Uh a partial stage of undress, and she's just covered in the, the beer cartons. But no clues as to what killed them. Were they murdered, or was it death by misadventure? The police could never work it out, nor could the coroner. But the dead woman's husband has no doubts. Geoffrey Chandler sees a more sinister scenario. A weird one, but given that the scientists were working on secret technology during the Cold War, may be plausible. I know that the two people who did it left on an aeroplane about half past nine that morning. Uh, I know that the whole thing was very thoroughly covered up, that the, that the inquest was uh, orchestrated. Uh, special branch was involved and uh, instructions came from the Prime Minister's department, Menzies. Geoffrey Chandler suspects CIA involvement. Government agents? Yes. Government agents. But others believe that Bogle and Chandler had simply overdosed on drugs. Remember that drawing? I think that they died from LSD overdose. The question of how they got it is another matter, and I don't think that that has been resolved. Forensic scientist Godfrey Ertel's theories were justified 30 years after the event when the preserved hearts of the victims were retested and found to contain large amounts of LSD. The problem was that there was little in the way of published material, because at the time, the only recorded death as a result of LSD was uh, that of an elephant, which sounds really bizarre. Um, but there was no evidence of a human animal dying from it. Bad trip or big brother killing of a scientist. To this day it remains one of Australia's most intriguing mysteries. And there's another macabre twist. Ruth Nash, who hosted the fatal 1962 party, died on New Year's Day 1974. Her husband Ken shot himself dead two years later. 
on New Year's Day. After the break, how two dental fillings sent detectives on a wild goose chase for 10 years. I happened to be uh, walking along the side of the road, leading a bull, uh, when I came to this culvert. And uh, looking down, I could uh, see this body lying at the uh, entrance to the culvert. It was a fairly gruesome sight, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes. The body that Tom Griffiths found in that culvert more than 60 years ago was of a young woman, her face mutilated and her body severely burned. A bag had been drawn over her head and shoulders and she was loosely clad in pyjamas. It was the beginning of a mystery that would keep police baffled for a decade. The beginning of the Pyjama Girl murder case. A local dentist made a cast of the victim's teeth and prepared a chart of all dental work for circulation throughout Australia. Identification of the body seemed like a mere formality. Just a few days and police could go about their business. But the days passed and a reporter noticed that the body which had been kept on ice was developing green spots. So it was brought here to the mortuary at the Faculty of Medicine at Sydney University. The body would be transferred to a formalin bath until further notice, as the authorities like to say. Hundreds of people anxious to help solve the crime have viewed the body, but with no result other than personal horror. For no one who has seen it once wants to see it again. By the end of the 1930s, the Pajama Girl case had become Australia's greatest murder mystery. One of the women on the missing persons list, who'd always roughly fitted the police description, was this young woman from Melbourne, Linda Agostini. Her husband Antonio had been a suspect, and he was even asked to view the body. Yet because of a single apparently insignificant oversight, the police let him go. The Albury dentist didn't notice two porcelain fillings on two front teeth. These had been so expertly executed that um, he just didn't notice them, and strangely enough, uh, they didn't show up on x-rays that he took. For the next ten years, police searched all round the world in a vain attempt to identify the pyjama girl. Desperate to solve the crime, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Bill Mackay, regularly put a fresh team of detectives on the case. In 1944, exactly a decade after the body was first discovered, a group of three dentists were asked to make yet another examination of the body they noticed a tiny gap in an upper bicuspid tooth which had not been recorded previously. After all that time in the formalin bath, one of the two porcelain fillings had fallen out. The dental chart of the pyjama girl now matched that of Linda Agostini in every detail. Suddenly they came back to the Agostini theory. And this is where the story gets really amazing. By an extraordinary chain of events, Agostini had now become a waiter at Romano's restaurant where Commissioner Mackay had his lunch. But one fateful day, the Commissioner had a tip for the waiter that he wouldn't like. Mackay simply contacted Agostini and asked him to come in and have a talk. And when he came in, he confessed to the whole thing. With the case now a decade old, police couldn't establish a motive for the killing. And to their dismay, Antonio Agostini was only convicted of manslaughter. In 1948, after serving less than four years, he was deported to Italy where he remarried and eventually died in 1969, 35 years after killing his first young wife. But if she was Australia's most famous victim of crime, then perhaps she's also the most forgotten. Linda Agostini, or rather Agostini Earl, is buried here in lot 8341 in Preston Cemetery in Melbourne. It cost the government hundreds of thousands of pounds to find out who she was, but when it was all over, there apparently wasn't enough money left to buy a headstone for a grave. After the break, how a patient old woman and a postman helped convict Australia's first kidnapper. The courthouse is concerned mainly with petty offences because of the almost total absence of serious crime. And despite the extensions, the incidence of crime remains static at an exceptionally low level. One of the films made by Ken Edwards about life in Newcastle in 1949.
September 20, 1950. Rang up just after 4 p.m. and was informed that I have a son. Wished momentarily that it hadn't been a girl to balance Michael, but suddenly found myself very pleased. We shall call him Howard. Doesn't resemble anybody yet. The unabounded joy of having a couple of healthy sons. It shines through Ken Edwards' diaries for all of his life. But around this time, Australia saw a crime committed that it never dreamt was possible in this good, clean, decent country. July 1st, 1960, and this man had good cause to be happy. Basil Thorne had just won the Opera House Lottery. A hundred thousand pounds for himself, his wife Frida, and their two children, Belinda, aged three, and eight-year-old son, Graham. The joy in the Thorns' Bondi flat would last just one week. Mr and Mrs Thorne were determined that their windfall would not disrupt Graham's school life. But he was obviously thrilled and he once told a school teacher, Do you know who I am? I'm Graham Thorne, the hundred thousand pound boy. Every morning he'd leave for school as usual and walk down here in Wellington Street, heading for the shop at the corner of O'Brien Street. But on July 7, the proud little boy somehow vanished from this corner. At first, the police treated the disappearance as a routine lost child investigation. But Frieda Thorne was convinced that it had something to do with the lottery win. Sergeant Lawrence O'Shea of Bondi Police arrived to take down a detailed description of Graham. Shortly after, the phone rang and Mrs Thorne answered. The caller said, Do I have the boy. I want £25,000. If you don't pay the money, I'll feed him to the sharks. A huge investigation with headquarters at Bondi Police Station swings into action. Notices are posted offering £15,000 reward for information leading to the boy's return and the apprehension of those responsible. A heartbroken father has this to say. All I can say is that it's not him. He's a father. He's got children of his own. Well, the search quickly moves to French's Forest with the discovery near this memorial of the missing boy's school case. The first major clue. Among the Five weeks after Graham Thorne disappeared, two small boys discovered his body jammed into a rock crevice in a small patch of scrub at Seaforth, about ten miles from where the boy had disappeared. Police would later prove that Graham Thorne's body had been transported to the spot wrapped in a travelling rug in the boot of the murderer's car. Also in the boot was a picnic basket, and how these clues were linked was a masterpiece of detection. The first problem was to find out where some plant fragments found on the rug had come from. And in a small cottage tucked away in a quiet corner of Sydney's Botanic Gardens, a patient woman supplied the breakthrough. We found that the work two plants which proved to be of significance that we knew as garden plants but were not bush plants were not present at the uh, site where Graham Thorne's body was found and uh, therefore must have been uh, uh, become uh, attached to the rug and clothing uh, somewhere else. Those two innocuous cypress cuttings were to help seal the killer's fate. After weeks of laborious cross-checking, a postman led detectives to a house which had both the shrubs they'd been looking for on each side of the garage entrance. The house was in a suburb no more than a mile from where Graham Thorne's body was found. It was vacant, but the name of the previous tenant was Stephen Leslie Bradley, already under suspicion. Bradley had already fled Australia on the liner Himalaya. Convinced they now had a complete case, Australian police flew to Colombo and Ceylon and arrested him on the ship. With courtroom spectators shouting, feed him to the sharks, Graham Thorne's kidnapper was sentenced to life in prison. Amongst the damning evidence linking the picnic basket, the blanket and Bradley were some hairs from his pet Pekingese named Cherry. Now, during the course of the trial, the dog was accidentally run over and killed. So it was duly stuffed and preserved as an exhibit. It survives today here at the Justice and Police Museum in Sydney as a macabre reminder of this truly horrible crime. 
Coming up, the killing that's caused millions of conversations and still has people. It's no accident that Australia's most fascinating killing took place here. Here, where heaven meets the earth, where man meets nature, where Aborigines have lived for 50,000 years and whites have been coming for holidays for 50 or so. Call it Uluru or call it Ayers Rock, this is a sacred site for the Yanangu people and a place for Seventh-day Adventists to pitch a tent. It's a place watched over by Chukurpa or Aboriginal law and a place where there's a cop every few hundred miles. But on the 17th of August 1980, it was white man's law and white man's mystery that focused the eyes of the nation and eventually the world on Australia's dead heart. It began with a cry in the wilderness and ended up dividing the nation. But whatever your opinion, it was impossible to ignore the disappearance of baby Azaria Chamberlain. I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? Zingo's got my baby. It's pointless now going into all the detail again. Three coronial inquests, two appeals, a royal commission, a court of criminal appeal hearing. But what's more telling are those haunting echoes that never seem to leave us. I knew the dog had something. I thought it had one of my husband's shoes because it was going like this to get out the door of the tent. Firstly, were they strange people? Just Seventh-day Adventists? The ones who make our wheat bix for breakfast. The name Azaria is uh, an old Hebrew name and it means blessed of God. And we felt we truly were blessed when we got our little daughters. And of course, a thousand other questions. Why would you take a nine week old baby to Ayers Rock anyway? Were the parents covering up for another of their children? And I rushed into the tent and we looked around quickly and couldn't see anything. I thought, my hat, a dingo. What, what else could have had? Mm. And I rushed out into the blackness and I felt as hopeless as I ever felt in my life. As for dingoes, well no question how clever they are. The locals told of one which could take meat out of a caravan fridge. And there'd been plenty of evidence of other dingo attacks. Aboriginal trackers said something had been wrong. Despite an intensive search around the rock, Azaria's body would never be recovered. Most of her clothing was found a week after she disappeared, five kilometres from the campsite. All that was missing, a white matinee jacket which Lindy swore her baby was wearing on the night she disappeared. But the coroner had no doubts with his biblical verdict. I just find that Azaria Cantal Loren Chamberlain, a child then of nine weeks of age and formerly of Mount Isaac, Queensland, met her death when attacked by a wild dingo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have the Chamberlains were exonerated from any involvement. But to cut a long story short, there'd be new evidence, new experts, and a new trial with Lindy, now pregnant, charged with murder. On September 13, 1982, Michael and Lindy Chamberlain arrived here at what was then the Supreme Court building in Darwin. It was the first day of a trial that would last a sensational 33 days. On each of those days, Lindy, her husband, and their lawyer, Stuart Tipple, would ascend these stairs. And waiting here would be a media pack that became just as interested in maternity dresses as murder. After each morning's parade, the questions like the pictures were the same. How was Lindy looking? Was that the trial itself became a battle between forensic experts who blinded each other with conflicting science. And there was that yellow tirana. Was that Azaria's blood on the floor or wasn't it? Someone decided it was. And Lindy was sentenced to life. This is the scene which many of the people thought would probably never happen. Alice Lynn Chamberlain in the back of a prison car, a convicted killer. But much of the forensic evidence would be discredited. And then a breakthrough. Remember the missing white matinee jacket? The baby's matinee jacket was found. Well, five and a half years after the tragedy, it was located near the rock during the search for a tourist who'd fallen from it. Well, I'm stunned. And... Amazed, but very grateful. Grateful why? Because I think this just goes to show once again that my wife was telling the truth. So finally, after spending years in jail and a decade in purgatory, the final chapter as Lindy Chamberlain is pardoned. Lindy Chamberlain walks from jail, free at last.
fully aware of the bitter irony of it all. Well, it's great to be pardoned for something you haven't done. You haven't done. You haven't done.